Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Trey, and my guest today is ICR research scientist and paleobiochemist, Dr. Brian Thomas. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, and, and well done uh, pronouncing that big, long word. A paleobiochemist, yes. <laughs> takes lots you, of practice. You practice that one well. <laughs> yes, in front of the mirror, just to make sure that I get it right. <laughs> right. Uh, so today, Dr. Thomas, we're going to be talking about all or nothing design. Uh, it's also referred to, I've heard it referred to as irreducible complexity, another phrase that I need to practice in front of the mirror to get that right. <laughs> uh, as I understand it, this refers to systems that we see in the natural world uh, that require all of its key components to function. Is that correct? That's it. It's got to have all of these parts or you don't have any functionality. So all or nothing systems. Okay. So these are, yeah, so I, I wouldn't say natural world. I'd say the created world because, you know, I believe the Bible. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> Me too. For anyone who's wondering. Yeah, okay. Uh, but yeah, that's it. So you have to have them all. Charles Darwin in his book, Origin of Species, uh, wrote that, you know, something like uh, if it could be demonstrated that, that any feature could not possibly arise by successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Mm. So what we're seeing is body systems that could not possibly arise by successive slight modifications because you have to have all of the modifications in place all at one time or you have nothing. Right. And so, uh, so, so in other words, that's what we see in the actual world of created uh, creatures. Right. Uh, because they didn't evolve uh, Right. Do you have any examples, any specific examples for us today? Well, for 20, 30 years, we've been talking about um, examples from within a single cell. Right. So that's that's probably maybe a good starting place, sure. at least for some of us who have some of a biology background. I mean, it's a pretty small building block, so we can go from there. If even the smallest piece is irreducibly complex, then... Oh, and it, and it is. Yeah. And in fact, it's 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 got orders and layers of... of all or nothing systems. Mm. So you can talk about one system and it needs all of its components, but it turns out that that system depends on a separate system that also needs all of its components. Mm. So you end up needing all the components for the first system and all the components for the second system. Otherwise you don't have a functioning cell. And then there's a third system and a fourth system and a fifth system. And you could spend, you could probably spend an entire career, a lifetime as a scientist, just mapping the, you know, the irreducible, Systems it's crazy. that are in a cell. So, but anyway, we could start with thinking about um, the um, how do you get how do you get a cell? Uh, what do cells do? Well, one of the main functions they have is to manufacture proteins. Mm -hmm. Cells make proteins. The, pro the proteins become parts of the cell itself, right. or they can be exported and become parts of your body. But how do you make a protein? Well, you need the instructional code, like the blueprint. So, uh, so that's in the DNA. So the DNA molecules that are in cells, all cells, um, mm -hmm. almost all cells, those contain the blueprints right. and the instructional, you know, the building codes, the, the instructions on how to build this protein. And so in other words, the DNA contains a language, all right, and it has information stored or encoded on the molecule, just like a paper has, you know, uh, printed text on it. Right. So the paper and the ink become the storage modes for information that might be on that paper. So similarly with DNA, instead of using a piece of paper, we're just using a chemical. Okay. Uh, and so, but here's the thing, you know, once you have your DNA, once you have the code that's, that's on it, that's in, you know, the information that's embedded in it, you have to store it, you have to access it, you have to pull it out of storage to access it. Right. You have to copy it. In other words, you have to um, you have to get it out of the library mm -hmm. and then put it into the hands of the foreman who's going to build the building, or in this case, put it in the the, the hands of the proteins that are going to make proteins. Right. So all this has to happen. But what does the storing and the pulling out of the library and the copying of the information? Well, proteins do all that. Proteins pick the DNA up, put the DNA back in the shelves, uh, read the DNA information, translate the information into something that could be useful in the cell to make proteins. 
So proteins are required to manage and even copy the DNA because, as we know, cells divide. Right. Cell division, right? And so you need another copy of all the DNA that's in that parent cell, and the full copy is going to go into both of the daughter cells that result from cell division. So you have to copy the DNA and do all these things. Proteins do the copying. Proteins do the storing. Proteins do the reading. you got to have proteins. Um, but so, so that leads us to the question, which came first, the proteins or the DNA? Uh, that's Be- a different take. <laughs> <laughs> because, you, because the DNA yeah. codes for the proteins, so you can't have the proteins without the DNA. Right. Because the DNA is the, has the codes for those proteins. But nor can you have the DNA without the proteins because it's, it's the proteins that manage and store and copy the DNA. Right. So you have to have them both standing together at the same time or you don't get anything. You don't have any... You don't have the core of life, or of a living cell, we should say. Right. You don't have a, you don't have a functioning cell without both proteins and DNA. Um, so that's one example of, that we can talk about of irreducible complexity. Wow, and those build out into so much more. And so, if, yeah, that smallest piece, right? That's that's incredible. Um, and it's way cooler to say which came first, the protein or the cell, than to say. Uh, the chicken or the egg. Let's be honest. Way well, more scientific. Well, I'm long past the generation that's it, that's that's able to identify what's cool or not. <laughs> so you're in that generation. So if you say so, I have to oh, just well. take your word for it. <laughs> All right, we'll go with that. Well, uh, any other examples? Maybe some um, some animals or plants or something like that. Oh, sure, just plenty. I mean, look at your own body. Right. Um, so. One of the, one of the things we need to emphasize when we talk about all or nothing systems is that there are parts of animal and human bodies that you don't actually have to have. Mm -hmm. You could still function in this world without some of these parts. Um, For example, if you were to uh, have an accident like a buddy of mine did uh, where he accidentally cut off his pinky finger, can can he function in this world without his pinky finger? Basically, yeah. yeah. He said the... The function that he misses the most is being able to grab a minnow out of a bucket of minnows for fishing. He can't do it with his left hand anymore because the minnow, no matter how much he closes and makes a fist, the minnow can squeeze out where, mm. that, where that pinky was. And, but how does he function? He just uses his right hand right. <laughs> to get the minnow out of the, bucket, the bait bucket. Um, so that's not the kind of body part. We're talking about core body parts. We're talking about those body parts that are essential to the function of the of the of the animal or man. So if it's a human body, you have essential parts. The like heart. A, hey, the heart might yeah, come in handy right. every once in a while. Okay, so you've got to have a heart and then you need to have lungs. Right. Maybe a brain would come in useful. Depends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so you don't need your pinky, but right. you do need your heart. Um and things like that. So it turns out that the human body has a number of parts that that are that are irreducible. Mm-hmm. You, you you cannot subtract from the human body the heart, for example, and still have a functioning human body. And so, so we just think about those things, and, mm-hmm. and it's like, okay, if you need both the heart and the lungs and 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 the brain and um, a liver, you've got to have these things. Mm-hmm. So how can you? obtain the first let's say fish that had heart gills irreducible parts of a fish right streamlined body something like that um, a bit, just all the features that you need to live underwater for a fish uh, how do you obtain that piece by piece right you can't it would die right it would die on its way to trying to evolve to become a fish mm-hmm. Um, and so this is a this is an important topic. It's an important subject to think about. How do you obtain the first, you know, bird able to fly? For example, mm-hmm. it's got to have lightweight features. It has to have um, flight control mechanisms, both the physical and also the software mm-hmm. to control those flight controls and to detect its environment, like. If, let's say you have a bird, but it doesn't have its ability to land yet. 
So it doesn't have this landing gear coordinated yet. Right. You know what's going to happen to that bird? Mm. Maybe, it may, maybe it jumps off and it starts to take flight, but when it comes time to land, boom, there goes its brains yeah. splattered all over the ground. So, such an ugly picture. It is, yeah. yeah. Well. And, it, there, there, and there goes its ability to, to evolve any further. Right. Uh, so anyway, uh, th- those, the, those are the kinds of examples we see. We can even see examples uh, in um, fossils. Okay. So my favorite fossil creature are the sauropod dinosaurs. And um, I read an article published in the journal Nature, very secular journal, right. no friend of creation at all. But because the world actually was created right. along with its creatures, it turns out that you can't get around creation. You right. end up having to talk about it anyway because that's the world we it. live in. Yeah. And so, there, so I read an article on sauropods, mm-hmm. and it basically described... Um, all or nothing body systems that all sauropods have. Now, the sauropod dinosaurs, pop quiz. Long uh, necks. Yes, the long necks. Yes. So long neck, long tail. Uh, but, but in order to have that long neck, long tail, and to be able to suspend that in air uh, efficiently mm-hmm. so that these creatures could live the way they did, it's basically solving the same kind of engineering problems that you do to make airplane wings. You wouldn't want to make airplane wings out of Cinder blocks as a building material. <laughs> no. So, so it turns out that the building material itself is also part of the irreducible right. construction of, of some of these creatures. So you got to have the bone. You have to have bones, but actually, other dinosaur bones are more. You know, they're more solid. They're more. I guess you'd say robust, but the sauropod neck vertebrae, for example, and the tail vertebrae. They're full of holes. They're full of gaps. Mm. And they have all these weird contours to them, raised ridges and things. Well, it turns out that those raised ridges are raised right at the point where it needs, you know, attachment support. And so the gaps and holes are all there to, to save weight, to make it lightweight. So it's very, very precisely engineered to have a lightweight bones so that it can raise this 30-foot-long neck well, and yeah. suspend it in space. Same with the tail. In order to have this long neck type of creature, you have to have the engineering already in place. Lightweight material, also lightweight design uh, of the shape of those, of those bones. Right. And, you, and then the author also described how you got to have a tiny head with a tiny brain. So they had the brain the size of a walnut, despite the fact that their bodies were 100 feet long. <laughs> Tiny little walnut brain. So it's not the size of the brain; it's the uh, it's the wiring. Right. I think that that made it work well. So it was well wired um, because it lived and had many generations w- that we know from fossils. Right. So you got to have a tiny brain. I mean, imagine T. Rex head. That's a big head. Mm-hmm. Uh, or even worse, the heaviest head of all the dinosaurs, Triceratops right. or, or the Ceratopsians. It's like a two thousand pound head once you flesh it out. Right. And you know, so, so try to lift that, stick that on the end of this long neck. Yeah, you know, it's not going anywhere. Not going anywhere. So, so you have to have a tiny head. You have to have these features. It, and then the article talked about the growth rate, like how fast it grows. That's also part of the. It's not just the structure, but it's how that structure matures. Right. That's also critical. So we're not talking about just physical parts, but the timing of the growth patterns of these physical parts. They said, take their word for it. You know, not my word. I'm just some crazy, silly creationist, some guy who believes the Bible. You know, you. I have a bias, unlike <laughs> these guys who hate God. That's not a bias, right? Anyway, so not at all. So, uh, so that so take their word for it. I mean, they're giving us some good information here, mm-hmm. and they're saying that you've got to have. Okay, so they talk about the knee joint of the sauropods, and so as these creatures got bigger, I mean, that, they got big fast, mm-hmm. and. Um, that was part of their defense mechanism because they didn't have horns and spikes and teeth. So they had to grow real real fast in order to not all get eaten. Um, So growth rate was, was, was um, critical, but then the knee joint, the, the joint itself actually widened. So the, so the surface area of the femur and the tibia where they contact at the knee joint that has to get broader and broader between those two bones in order to distribute the body weight, um, tons 30 tons right. <laughs> you got to support yeah. 30 tons it's a lot on a pillar a lot. you know and the pillar has to walk it has to be a mobile you know jointed pillar 
So how are you going to distribute all that weight? Well, how about we just widen the knee joint as the creature grew throughout its life? And so these growth patterns are also part of that. So that's, those are some of my... So how do you get a sauropod? How do you get that? Without well, having you. all those features all in place at the same time. Mm -hmm. And this secular author and others like him uh, would agree. Well, this, this all just came together. It all just came together. Just like it needed to. How very unlikely, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. Um, yeah, now I'm thinking about a sauropod dinosaur with the head of a triceratops trying to like eat tree tree leaves and just unable to get his head up. You know, it's just like, wow, that's a, a sad picture. It's a <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, that's what evolution requires, right? Supposedly, uh, just lots of death and uh, uh, years, millions of years of death. But that's a lot of examples. Um, and the fact that we see irreducible complexity today, um, in your mind, what are, what are the implications, the broader implications of that? What does that say to you? Well, first of all, I think it's, before I directly answer that question, let me just suggest that it's a good thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's healthy for us to turn our attention to, uh, these, these body systems or cellular systems right. that uh, have components that lean on one another and um, and cannot function unless all of them are present and fully formed. Right. So why is it important to talk about it and think about it? I think because our evolutionary colleagues don't talk about it. They, right. they, they don't even emphasize irreducibly complex components uh, of, of living creatures. Because it doesn't support their their view, right. you know, which is uh, which is that Darwin was right that creatures um, evolved by slow and successive slight modifications, accreting one bit after another over mm -hmm. eons. Uh, if that's how it came to be, then we really shouldn't see the kinds of um, uh, all or nothing systems that we do see, right? Because <clears throat> so so that's. That's my first reaction to your question is this is healthy to think about. It's healthy to talk about. It's, it's a, it, it, it gives us water cooler fodder, right? Water cooler conversations. It's like, yeah. what do you, what do we want to talk about uh, around the water cooler, taking a break in the office or whatever? And so, um, okay, Trey, we used to have these things called water coolers. <laughs> yes. I know you're in the different I've seen, generation. I, I think I've seen pictures of them before. So, yeah. So you might know <laughs> what the, I'm talking from about. From the ancient past. Right. <laughs> so, this gives us a question we can ask our friends like mm -hmm. okay e evolution right well how do you how, how do you explain all or nothing systems you know for example and have have an example in mind like like the, your dna and protein how did how do you get the dna without the protein and the protein without the dna like that's a pretty good question right. so it's helpful it's helpful to think about because i think the evolutionary uh, um, way of thinking um, ignores a huge realm of mm -hmm. biology by just not talking about it, so let's let's raise the question and talk about it. Um, so, but to get to the more direct answer to your question, you know, how does all or nothing thinking impact our you know our life and and world? Mm -hmm. um, one way is to give us encouragement and confidence that as Christians who believe in the Bible, that God created you know, what, what we call ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. Like he spoke and it stood fast, right. Psalm 33. Uh, that's how it all started. In other words, the Lord Jesus is the divine engineer. All things came from him and through him, uh, Colossians 1.16. And so if that's the case, instead of natural processes over eons, we have a supernatural processes, you know, over six days. Right. Um, if that's the case then what should we expect to see? Maybe all or nothing systems that could only have arisen if all the parts were engineered and put in position all at once, all at the same moment in time in history. And that's what the Bible portrays, right. the origin of, of living systems as having, having occurred by, by supernatural. Okay, so, so this all boils us down to Romans one twenty, For the invisible attributes of God have been made known, they're clearly seen, having been made known through that which he has made. Well, what has he made? 
He's made all or nothing systems. Mm -hmm. What do these all or nothing systems show or tell about the creator of them? Well, he's a genius. <laughs> he's sure. like a super genius. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we ought to give, so for Christians and for just people, we ought to give credit to whom the credit is due. Why would we give credit to natural processes for doing something that natural processes never have done and never could do? Mm -hmm. We need to give credit where it belongs, and that is to the God of creation, who happens to be, as the Bible reveals, the Lord Jesus Christ. So how much more fitting is it, you know, for us as as worshipers, because right. that's what humans are. We're either going to worship ourselves or worship the God who deserves it, you know, to actually give the credit and the glory and the honor to the Lord Jesus for doing what He actually did. It's uh, it's 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 very fitting for us to do that. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, when you really put it that way, uh, putting Jesus at the center of it, it really does show his. Uh, just also not just his genius, but his creativity, right? Like just how awesome some of these creatures that we see and how, how irreducibly complex they are. That's, it's honestly mind blowing when you look at it. So we do actually have a book uh, that discusses this topic a little bit. Uh, it's called Creation Basics and Beyond. Uh, for all of our viewers, uh, you can find this on our web store or if you uh, come visit us at the Discovery Center in Dallas, Texas, you can come uh, pick up a copy. It also talks about a lot of other topics, uh, so there's 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 a lot going on there. Uh, but thank you so much for your time, Dr. Thomas. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Uh, for all of our listeners, thank you for tuning in. Uh, you can find this podcast on YouTube and wherever else you might get your podcasts. Um, and make sure to leave us a like, subscribe, uh, give it a rating, share it with whoever you want to, please. Uh, it would be great to reach more people with the truth of creation. Uh, and with that, I'm Trey, and uh, we'll see you next time on the Creation Podcast.